In this lesson we'll be picking up from the last lesson, Angular Material Forms from Firestore. I've added a card up here so you can check it out before watching this video. There is also an entire series that we're building this application from the ground up. We'll start in Angular and we'll continue on to the next language that we pick in the community forum on Slack. In this lesson, we'll be talking about Angular Reactive Forms update from Firestore. We'll be using the form builder to create a form group and form control that includes validation. And then we'll push that data to Firebase Firestore for an update on the backend. We'll be continuing from where we left off in the last lesson. You can navigate through AJ's books and you can hit the edit on any book. This is the same form with some additional buttons with the navigation that's working. Angular Material will allow you to set some pretty cool validation. In this example, we have a length of 500 that it picks up. You also can show how to require any field that we might need. The first thing that we're gonna look at is a new class called book. We've switched this from a interface and have added it into a class so that we can create an object whenever we need to from the data for Firestore and from Firestore. What we're gonna do next is subscribe to a Firestore observable so that we can get the current value on the Firestore database for our book. We're gonna capture the book ID from our navigation from the parameter and we'll pass in a rebuild form command. Within this rebuild form command, we'll add a book form reset. We'll talk more about this later, but then we'll also add a git book, which will update that observable. And it will allow us to then create our book form and add all of the correct values that are currently in Firestore to our book. The reason we're using a pipe map here is because we have a date and we need to convert it. The book form itself will have all of these form controls, including the age category, description, title, everything that we have on our form right now. We'll then be using that to update our forms. You can see here that the validators allow for max lengths. We'll set 50 to title and 500 to description. That way, if they go past that, it will invalidate the form. Within the form itself, we'll switch out the ng models and we'll add form control names that match back on the same in the TS config. So for instance, title matches title over here and it has a value of book.title coming from Firestore. So again, you'll see book.title will provide the value. The validators are required and max length of 50. What we can look at now on the form side of this in the material form field is we can use another component called mat error. And this will show the red text that we're looking for whenever 50 is surpassed in the max length. The other material error that we wanna add is the required error. Now, if you look closely, we only wanna see the material error for the length of 50 when the required is not showing up because that means there's a blank field. However, we'll want to see the required field only when the required is necessary, which is when the field itself is blank. As you can see here, I'll highlight all of the form control names. They're gonna match up with all of the names that we placed into our form builder inside of the group. Each one of these will then be binding to the control itself which will allow us to access and update the values and the form will then know if it has a valid value or an invalid value and we can pass those to Firestore. In order to pass the values to Firestore, we need to submit the entire form. However, we don't wanna show the submit button until we have pristine data, which means it is all entirely valid and filled out the way we want it to be. So in this directive for disabled, we're actually saying if it's pristine and not valid, don't show the button. So it's kind of reverse logic. It's disabled, but both those values need to be true. To help clarify a little, pristine actually means that the form has some dirty data in it. So it's been updated in some way. Unlike the submit button, the revert button, we need to be able to click and reset the data back to the original Firestore data. So we're gonna show that the minute that the form has any updates. Now that we've talked about the submit button, you can see here in ng submit, we have save book changes. 
This will submit our entire book form, which is attached to the input on form group, which has book form associated to it. As a reminder, book form is a parameter that sits on our class, so we have access to it. When we did initialize down in the rebuild form function, we were able to set the values for this and subscribe to our Firebase Firestore observable. Because we're subscribing to this observable, it allows data to flow from Firestore into our controls so that the data will always remain updated from any changes in the backend Firestore database. Because our submit button is a true submit button, it will take this form for a HTML form and submit it using ng submit. It will call the function save book changes. You can see here that we're creating a new book based on our TypeScript class that we created in the beginning. And this will allow us to use any values from our form. This is because of this initial constructor that we created that allows for a partial book. It'll take any values that match and place them into the book object. We can then take the instance of our book that we created and we'll call the Firestore function to update our book. And then we will navigate to books with the current book ID once we're completed back out to the edit screen. As you can see here, we're still using our Angular Firebase wrapper service. Uh, this is provided by Jeff Delaney over at Fireship.io. Check him out. Um, anyways, what this allows us to do is anytime we do an update, it will create a update timestamp as well. In the update book function, we're going to take in a parameter called book. It's a type book, obviously. We're going to pass that to an update that allows us to go to our books collection with our book ID. And then the values that we'll pass to that are the entire book object for update. There are many people that do not like the promise then structure. Instead, we can switch this over to have a await structure involved. So on this side of the call, we will just add the await keyword and then we can remove the then and the end of the function call. And then all we need to do is add the async to the start of the function. It'll perform the same way as having then. If we go through the full navigation, we can see that by navigating to the correct book, we can then have all the values defaulted from the original. And if we select anything and change things, it doesn't change on the fly, it actually changes on the submit. And that's a key difference. You can set up forms to actively update Firestore. I prefer it this way so you get more validation and only change when you want to. This is definitely a UI UX type of decision. Of course, you could always update this and update on every change in value. It is this reason that we can now type something all completely wrong and then hit the revert button and it will repull the values that are currently in Firestore so that we're up to date again and we can sync them with Firestore. If I were to update the database from anything else, it will automatically have the values change and we could see it in the current UI. Bien y ve vea AJ's perfecto soluciones.